David Bratt. I'm executive editor at Erdman's, and I'm here with Greg Tenelshoff from Biola University, who has written a book on Confucius and Christianity. We're here to talk about it today. So I'm going to start with a big, dumb question. <laughs> who was Confucius? Confucius is to um, uh, China and the East roughly what um, uh, Socrates or Plato, Aristotle are to the West. So he's he's uh, a, a classical Chinese philosopher from whom sprang uh, really the whole of, or at least the foundation for the, the Eastern um, uh, wisdom tradition in China. I think when I was growing up and I heard about, and we studied the different religions of the world, uh, I think at some point we talked about Confucianism. And yet it sounds to me, what you've just described doesn't sound to me like a religion exactly. What, how would you describe what Confucianism is? Yeah, it's a, um, th there is some controversy about whether or not it's um, uh, a religion. Um, but whether or not it's a, it's a religion, it is a wisdom tradition. And by that I mean it's a, um, it's a, it's a tradition of thought given over to questions about how best uh, to conduct the human life. How, how ought we to live? How, how can we find our way into um, uh, uh, personal flourishing, interpersonal uh, flourishing, um, uh, political um, uh, peace, and the like of that. So, so Confucius had a lot to say about um, uh, practices and strategies for finding your way into flourishing. And those who followed in his wake, this tradition of thought, um, um, uh, developed uh, what he had to say. So he's, he's first a philosopher, I think, one who was interested in questions about the good life. And, um, uh, um, and s second, maybe a religion, depending on how you uh, uh, treat or define religion. How does one, is there, is there a way of becoming officially a follower of Confucius? Is there some <laughs> sort of seminary training that one goes through? No, no, no more than, um, I, I'd say most people who are um, uh, walking in the way of uh, Confucius have fallen into that more or less unconsciously um, in just the way that um, uh, Western folks are walking in the way of Plato and Aristotle. Whether, whether we've heard of Plato or Aristotle, whether, we, whether we've read any Plato or Aristotle, our, our way of being in the world, our way of thinking about the world, our way of talking about ourselves and locating ourselves in the world, it's all informed by this tradition that comes to us from uh, Plato and Aristotle. There's this other tradition uh, in, in the East, in China, um, that, that traces back to Confucius. And so um, uh, uh, quite a few people are, are walking in the way of Confucius, whether or not they've um, consciously reflected on that or made, made um, intentional decisions in that uh, direction. So part of what uh, motivated me in the book was uh, I started asking the question, what would it look like to, to port wisdom from uh, the Confucian tradition into the way of Jesus following? Uh, most of the people with whom I've moved and spent my life have been, um, who have been Christian people who are, who are practicing the way of Jesus in a way that's informed by the philosophical system that traces back to uh, Plato and Aristotle. So interesting question, what might it look like to, uh, to walk in the way of Jesus in such a way as to be informed by the wisdom that comes out of uh, Confucius and his intellectual descendants? Is Confucius, is it, uh, the, tr the, the culture from which he comes now it, in, in China, this is um, officially a, a, secular, a secular society, socialist, um, with, with plenty of references to Marx and to Mao. Yeah. Does, is, Conf, is Confucius spoken of? Is he referred to in contemporary Chinese society? Yeah, there's a kind of um, there's a kind of res, resurgence or a renaissance of Confucian uh, thought in um, in China. Confucianism uh, fell on hard times with the uh, Cultural Revolution and the and the um, and with Mao and the in the in the um, the events that that followed his his rule. Um, but in recent years, uh, um, uh, Chinese scholars and, and, and uh, f folks in China, I think, are rediscovering uh, the riches of their intellectual heritage. And so there's a kind of return to Confucianism in China. And then there's a, a little bit of a spillover, I think, because there's this uh, Confucian renaissance in China, uh, uh, folks in the West who, who have inter any interaction with uh, the East are, are sort of wondering what's that, what, what's that all about, what, uh, what's going on over there. 
So how does a Biola University professor get interested in Confucian? How does he find his way into Confucianism? Yeah, I, um, uh, I, I was sort of dragged um, to China on a trip that I, I, I wasn't terribly excited to go on um, and didn't know much about um, uh, Chinese uh, history or culture or philosophy. But very shortly after getting there, I, I, I sort of um, fell in love with the culture and with the people and, um, and suffered the kind of uh, um, embarrassment that, that uh, uh, Americans often do when they go into another culture and know nothing about it. And so I started um, asking questions about Confucianism. And in particular, I started asking, um, w what's, it, what's it like for would-be Christians to be presented with um, uh, the Christian way? In a way that uh, that that poses a, a choice between their native wisdom tradition and uh, the way of Jesus, um, would-be Western Christians aren't presented with that kind of choice. They're presented with Christianity in a way that comports well with the Western philosophical themes and emphases, and so we're not implicitly or explicitly invited to disavow our native wisdom tradition in order to accept and follow after uh, Jesus. Um, so I, I started with this kind of uh, evangelistic impulse. What, what, would it, what would the way of Jesus look like if expressed in themes, in categories at home in the, in the Chinese uh, philosophical system? But what started as, as um, a sort of evangelical impulse became for me a, a deeper interest and in a, in a sort of um, a deeper appreciation. I, uh, I found that there was much uh, beautiful in the tradition, much that, that corrects well some of the um, missteps of uh, contemporary Western uh, uh, thinking. So what started for me as an evangelistic sort of interest became a more intrinsic uh, interest in, in the beauty and, and the wisdom in the Confucian way. Did you have conversations with uh, people in China who had stumbled on the Aristotelian, Platonic uh, sort of preconceptions of Christianity? Yeah, um, there were those who, so in, in, uh, in China, there were those with whom I spoke who, um, especially in connection with their, their deep commitment to filial piety, um, they worried that, that um, Christianity, as it was expressed to them, was a highly individualistic um, uh, uh, thing. It's, it's me and, and a decision that I make in connection with uh, Jesus and the gospel. And at best, it had nothing to do with my uh, family. And at worst, it meant um, sort of disassociation from my family and my ancestors and, uh, and, and my traditions. And um, so this was, this was problematic. And I think it, it functioned as a kind of stumbling block for, uh, for people in China. And do you think that's um, especially true because for people who become Christians in China, they're often making a decision that breaks with family history and so so that may be that may seem like a point of particular emphasis for them that's problematic yeah it's a, it's a break from their history but it's also a break from their um, from their way of understanding ongoing um, family relationships relationships with uh, with father and mother and aunt and and uncle there's um, there's a there's a way of understanding uh, the call of Jesus which would in, invite you to um, diminish the importance of your loyalty to uh, mother, father, aunt, uncle, uh, older brother, older sister, and the like of that. And, um, and that, that is a real stumbling block, I think. It seemed to me when I read the book that by getting us to look at the way of Jesus through Confucian eyes, that in some ways it was getting us back maybe more toward the world of the Middle East in some yeah. ways in which Jesus lived and into which he spoke. I think that's right. And it's, it's especially true in connection with this, um, this business about filial pieties. So um, we all know, uh, all of us who've sort of read the Bible and thought about the Christian way, we know that Jesus was calling his disciples into family-like communities uh, where they would address one another in familial terms. And so we, we're not unfamiliar with the idea that we should that, that the church should be something like a family and, and we and we talk that way about about the church as family but the problem is that that the the way we do family in the West is nothing at all like the way um, family is thought of in 
uh, certainly classically in China and also in the Middle East, and in the and in the um, the culture that Jesus and Paul addressed when they used these uh, these filial terms. And so, one way of thinking about what's happened to the church in North American culture is we've called people to treat it like family, and they've done exactly like uh, they've done exactly that. They're treating the church in the same way that they're treating their family. They, they think of it as a, a loose association of more or less autonomous individuals who might be able to help each other for a season, but who could easily um, uh, uh, fall out of relationship and go their separate ways. But when Jesus and Paul called their disciples into family-like relationships, they had something uh, much deeper and, and much, um, I don't know, more, more stable in mind. It was a, it was a, um, a, a complex set of long-term relationships without which you couldn't even understand yourself. To think of yourself without, without family um, would have been very difficult in, in these settings and not so much in the contemporary West. When you talk to your students at a Christian university about Confucius, um, are they suspicious? Are they uninterested? Is, 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 is there a, a kind of engagement, a natural engagement there? Or yeah. do you have to sort of talk them into it? Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it's a mixed group. I, I think many of them came up in settings like the one in which I came up. Uh, I came up in a setting where the word Eastern, when affixed to words like thought, uh, religion, philosophy, meant or had connotations like uh, dangerous, relativistic, illogical, uh, paradoxical, and so uh, certainly not to be taken seriously and, and perhaps to be avoided altogether. And I think um, some of my students come out of that background. and so. Um, uh, for them, part of the learning experience is just to see, oh, um, these, are, these are deep thinkers. They're not illogical. Uh, most of it is, is not relativistic. In fact, it, it stands steadfastly against uh, relativism and, and many of its uh, main threads. And so, so for many of them, it's just an unwinding of this, this negative association uh, with Eastern thought. For others, it's, it's, it's been more natural. They, they, um, They've come to be philosophy majors, many of them, because they want to be sort of scientists of the good life. They want to, they want to, they want to um, look around for wisdom wherever it's to be had about how uh, about how to flourish as people and as communities and as churches and as Jesus followers. And for them, the idea that we would mine um, Confucian is no more foreign than the idea that we would mine Aristotle or the Stoics or or any of these other deep traditions. Why, why should Confucius be important to readers of an Erdman's book? Well, um, one of the other topics that I've thought about is, is self-deception. And um, one, one way that we come to be self-deceived is by surrounding uh, ourselves with people who think just like we do. And if you're interested in finding your way out of self-deception, if you're interested in, in finding your blind spots, then one of the best things you can do is immerse yourself in, um, in communities or in literature that comes from a perspective other than your own. And so um, well-meaning uh, Western Christians arguably have blind spots just insofar as their only acquaintance uh, uh, with wisdom about the good life comes to them from the West. And one way to, one way to um, circumvent those blind spots to see what you haven't seen before is, is to read some literature that, that comes at things from a slightly different perspective. We're seeing a number of books at Erdman's uh, coming in uh, that attempt to de-westernize Christianity, to, to, to bring it more into conversation with the majority world. Are, are you uh, seeing that at, at Biola? Are you, are, do you see this as kind of part of a broader project of, of, of waking Christians up to what's available to them outside of their tradition? Yes, to the second way of putting it, I, I do think part of, I mean, part of this is just comes out of convictions about what it is to, to be liberally educated, you know, to, to, um, to learn about several different perspectives. Um, so I am, I am uh, passionate about that. I guess I don't resonate with the desire to de-westernize um, uh, Christianity. It's, it seems, I, I personally have, uh, my faith is stronger and I've learned much about the way of Jesus precisely through uh, the lens of, of Western philosophical literature. Western philosophy has helped me um, immensely to, to move further up and further in uh, to the way of Jesus. That said, uh, 
the Western um, philosophical system isn't the only one. So th maybe there are other uh, philosophical systems which would be helpful to us as we try to move further up and further in. So it's not that I want to de-Westernize, it's that I want to I want to add to the Western uh, picture some of these other uh, pictures that, that might be fruitful and helpful for us. Greg Tenelshoff, thank you for talking with us. Thank you for having me.